thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe below so we can expand our Squatch search with your help. Report number 48665 Class Alpha. Year 2015. State Louisiana. Observed 100% Bigfoot Melville, Louisiana. Approximately 115 on a rainy day. Bigfoot walked out of the tree line, took five steps to the right, and back into the tree line about 100 yards away from our house. Also noticed broken tree limbs. Other witnesses, one. Other stories, yes. Time and conditions, 1.15 p.m. Environment, rainy. Follow-up investigation report by BFRO investigator Michael Janakis. I spoke with the husband H and wife W. Location is near Melville, Louisiana, northeast of Lafayette. They are on a property that has 70 acres of land, most of which is heavy forest and swamplands. Their land is adjacent to a bayou and is close to a major river, the Achafalava River. Their land is also located near Achafalava Wildlife Refuge. Background, both H and W are in their 30s. They are from the Ozarks originally. They moved to this property earlier this year. The property had been vacant for seven years prior following the death of the elderly female owner. To H's knowledge, there are no reports that he's aware of from the lady or nearby residents. The property was vacant for seven years simply because of the remote location. The report, Monday, 5-11-15 at 1.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. There is a light rain. Home alone, W is standing outside on the west end of the home smoking a cigarette. She then hears a high-pitched, short-duration whoop near the tree line 105 yards to her southwest. The distance was subsequently measured by H. Between her and the tree line is a one to two foot high meadow. The hoop causes her to drop her cigarette. As she's picking it up from the wet ground, she then hears a very low pitched, deep, manly whoop coming from what she felt was the same general location of the first whoop just seconds prior. She looks up and sees a seven and a half to eight foot tall Sasquatch stepping out from the tree line. It used both arms to push the trees aside in order to step out. As it steps out, W sees the thigh muscle flexing. It has dark brown hair, but it wasn't fur-like. It's just hairy. You could see skin beneath the hair in many places. The top of the head has shorter hair, but the back of the head is longer hair. She describes it as looking like a mullet, very muscular, no neck. As it steps out fully in one stride, it immediately turns to its right and takes five long steps, swinging its arms before it turns right and steps back into the forest. The witness repeats several times that the oddest part of this whole event was that the Sasquatch never once looked up, not at her, the house, or the meadow. It purposely looked down the entire time. W felt as if to imply it was not a threat. As it took the five steps, it would lean back as it brought its foot up, then lean forward into the step. When H went to the area to investigate it, he said the ground had sticker bushes two feet tall and four feet across, which would account for the deliberate steps. He also added there was no way for him to make those same steps. It was too far of a stride with the sticker bushes in the way. It walked somewhat hunched over, long arms, hands lower than the knees. She described the shoulder width as being massive, two and a half times the width of her husband, 5'11", 205 pounds. When the squatch was stepping back into the tree line, it had to duck slightly under a thick tree limb. H later measured the limb to be seven and a half feet above the ground. W called H, who was several hours away at school in Baton Rouge, and asked him to come home immediately. H said she's a very level-headed person and she's never made a request like this, so he came home immediately. When H went to the area, he stayed on the phone with W, who was able to guide him into the exact spot. 
H said he could not see one to two feet into the trees due to dense, tall underbrush. As he stepped into the tree line, he could see an area of trampled down grass and broken four feet long limbs that had been stacked. He said you could see where something had been pacing and it looked like it had been going for a long time. There were also limbs broken eight to nine feet above. Some, H said, were greater than six inches in diameter. No prints, no hair was visible. The area inside the tree smelled like wet dog. He said his house was visible from within this hidden area and that was all he could imagine it was for. No discernible trail could be seen inside the tree line. He said the entire time he was inside the tree line he felt uneasy. He described it not as being scared or being hunted or anything, rather that this was something else's area and he didn't belong there. Last night his dog started barking for the first time and went running out to that same spot at the tree line but wouldn't go into the trees. After a minute they suddenly stopped and came running back to the house. Today they will not go anywhere near the trees. There are many cows in the area. H says one of them died two weeks ago and the rancher had let it lay there to rot. H wonders if that bad stink of the decaying cow somehow attracted the squatch. He says there are lots of deer and hogs in the woods and swamp areas, as well as horses and cows. There are bears, but he's been told they've all been given neck collars that are visible for tracking their movement. He says he and his wife are familiar with bears and that what W saw was not a bear. This is a follow-up report for number 48665. With H. heavy foliage and very wet due to the recent Sunday, July rains. 3rd, 2016. Wet and swampy. Hot and humid there is summer. A late afternoon. Field H. Nearby. His wife and his wife friend are riding horses from the at their ranch. Farm. When one of the young dogs gets accidentally trampled and killed, H's daughter, 14 years old, D, was particularly fond of the dog and was distraught. She jumped on a quad and drove it down a dirt road a distance from the home. She stopped in a remote area next to the bayou and surrounded by forest. It was now dusk and was beginning to get dark. Clear skies, no moon lit, a new moon that day less than 2% visible. H and his wife's friend were trying to dig a grave for the dog near the house. He mentioned the ground being very hard. From a distance that H estimates to be 200 to 300 yards into the forest, both H and the friend hear a loud, powerful scream coming from the forest. H had a difficult time describing the scream. He said he's never heard anything like it. It was not an Ohio howl type of scream. His exact words were that as it was like a long screech scream. He said it was so loud that it echoed and drowned out the sound of a nearby oil pump. I directed him to several websites with recorded screams to see if he could find something close to it. Interesting, however, D was closer to the direction of the scream, but did not hear it. At the same time H was burying the dog, D is still parked at the remote spot. She was sobbing loudly. She tried to call her girlfriend Paige to tell her about the dog, but she got no signal. She continued to cry, and in frustration she took off her hat and hit the quad with it. That's when she heard a knock on a nearby tree. H did not know how loud it was, need to ask D. She turned around and scanned the forest in the direction she thought the knock came from. Her first scan she saw nothing, but on her second scan she saw a Bigfoot staring back at her. He was 15 feet away peering from behind a tree, both eyes, most of head and most of shoulder. She said she was terrified and did not move. After a few seconds the Bigfoot slowly stepped out from behind the tree, its entire body and head visible to her. After a few moments, it turned to the left and slowly, calmly walked into the forest. Not taking her eyes off of the Bigfoot, Dee started up the quad. 
H says it's not in the best mechanical shape and is very loud, but the sound did not startle the creature. It looked back briefly, but never slowed or accelerated its stride. She described the creature as being huge with massive shoulders. She said she could clearly make out the balls of its shoulders and they were very muscular. She did describe to H that it had a visible neck, which is interesting. Hair everywhere except around its eyes and on its hands. She said the eyes were huge and had no white. They were dark colored and she could make out a smaller pupil. She said it looked and moved like it would be very fast and limber. H went back to, sighting, to the sighting spot that night with neighbor and D. They measured the height to be seven and a half to eight feet tall. He said there was what he thought was a significant amount of saliva on the tree in the spot the mouth would have been. He collected it with a knife and cellophane wrap. It's probably not a viable sample. He could not find footprints, but there were heavy depressions in the forest litter. He has been fascinated with the Bigfoot subject since his wife's sighting last year and thought to bring a banana and some tomatoes to the site with him. He left the tomatoes on a stump and the banana in the crook of the tree it had stood behind. Three days later, the banana and tomatoes were missing. At the stump where the, where the tomatoes were located, there was a new pile of nine rocks. He also says he's since found the stem of the banana peel on top of sticks that were placed in a crook of a tree. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe below so we can expand our Squatch search with your help. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe below so we can expand our Squatch search with your help. If you do have an encounter to tell, send to SoCal Sasquatch Organization at gmail.com. We now have SCSO Keep On Squatchin' t-shirts available. See link in description below. Join the community and show it off wherever you go. Report number 57401, Class Alpha. Family driving a rural two-track have a late day encounter north of Higgins Lake. Year 2017. Season, spring. Month, April. Date, third. State, Michigan, County, Roscommon County, location details, specific directions omitted upon the family's request, nearest town Higgins Lake, observed. We live in Michigan near a national forest. One evening my two 18-year-old daughters and I took my pickup down a two-track looking for rocks for our fire pit we were building. It was light out with a light rain. We were coming up over a ridge on the trail and when we were starting down, a huge Bigfoot ran across the trail in front of us. We all saw it well. It was covered in long black hair with a patch of white hair along its back near its shoulders. It was running with amazing speed in a forward leaning position and its arms seemed to almost touch the ground. As it ran we figured it to be approximately nine foot tall. We could clearly see legs, arms, hands, head, muscle definition throughout its body even with long hair. The hair on its back and body was longer than the hair on its head and arms. We didn't get to see its face though. But the strangest part of this was that it was running with a gray colored wolf that I've seen multiple times before. It really appeared that they were together. The wolf was at full stride about 15 feet behind it. Once it cleared the track, it went up the hill on the other side with an amazing speed. It seemed to pull away from the wolf at the last little bit we watched it. <clears throat> we tried to drive to where the, they last were to try and see them again, but they were gone. That wolf was ran very close to me on my four-wheeler, and I can tell you he is no little puppy. He leaves an almost five and a half inch track and the Bigfoot dwarfed the wolf. The next day I went back to look for prints, but the 14 hours of heavy rain overnight ruined any prints there might have been. 
we have found several other four-toed, very large prints in the area. A local BF researcher came out to investigate the area and was impressed with what is called tree structures. There was a couple found like a teepee style and one is very large but the trees are upside down. Weird. I have pictures of the things we have found and are happy to share all of my evidence we have found to help others know these things are real and they exist here in Michigan. Also noticed, the speed at which it was able to move was just amazing and the wolf running with it like a pet was very strange. We have heard loud roaring sounds in those woods many times with many different people over the last few months since deer season and I found prints in the snow that I've recorded with four toes. Two different sized four toed prints were found crossing a sandy trail in the morning. I took pics of those also. Other witnesses, yes my 18 year old daughters, we were riding in the pickup looking straight ahead down the trail when it crossed. We all saw it very well. Other stories, two men live out in the, that forest in a house with no electricity. They both have claimed to see a Bigfoot. One was very close to our incident and one of the men says he's heard the roaring call like sound from time to time and a Tarzan sound behind his house from time to time. He literally lives around almost no one the majority of the year. Time and conditions, evening about 7.45 p.m. it was light out with a slight rain. Environment, this is a forest area state owned where there are swampy areas with dense pine all around. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe below so we can expand our Squatch search with your help. If you do have an encounter to tell, send to SoCal Sasquatch Organization at gmail.com. We now have SCSO Keep On Squatching t-shirts available. See link in description below. Join the community and show it off wherever you go. Follow-up investigation report by BFRO investigator Richard Knox. <clears throat> the witness has had several encounters. I will document each encounter in separate statements in an attempt to avoid confusion. First encounter. The first area is northwest of Higgins Lake in Roscommon County. There are few actual roads within this area. Most roads are two tracks used by those vacationing in the area for fun or by hunters during a seasonal hunting period. Those off-road trails form a checkerboard pattern throughout this area. This checkerboard consists of open farmland, blocks of woods, patches of scrub brush dotting the area and the occasional open area that has a pump jack. There are small creeks, a few one-acre lakes, some patches of swamp, and a few seasonal wetlands. Though US-127 is nearby, once you get a few hundred yards into the area, the only indications of civilization is the two-track trails that outline the checkerboard and the occasional pump jack. <coughs> Glaciers shaped the area. A large portion of the area is the so-called Grayling Outwash Plain which consists of broad outwash plain including sandy ice, disintegration ridges, jack pine barrens, some white pine, red pine forest, and northern hardwood forest. Large lakes were created by glacial action. There are a varied assortment of wildlife, examples geese, ducks, deer, squirrels, raccoons, etc. Along with farm crops, example soybean, corn, fruit, etc. The area the witness had one of his encounters is wooded with ash, birch, and pines while the terrain is mostly rolling hills with wetlands and the occasional kettle dotting the landscape. On one of the two tracks previously noted that form the checkerboard pattern there are no major power corridors located nearby, but north of the encounter is what appears to be the outline of a former creek. The witness explained to me that he was in his pickup with his daughters looking for stones for a fire ring they were working on. <coughs> 
They were heading east on the two-track when they crested a hill in front of them when something ran in front of their vehicle heading south. The witness stated that it was covered in hair that appeared black in color with what appears to be a white or lighter color patch between its shoulder blades. The creature could have possibly been on all fours because the witness noticed that it was leaning forward and that its arms almost reached the ground, but it was coming up an incline, crossed the road and up another incline so the arms may have been stretched out to grab a hold of anything in front of its travel path, trees, earth, stumps, etc. The witness also noted that directly behind the creature was a large wolf that appeared to be keeping pace with the creature and that he felt <clears throat> the wolf wasn't chasing the creature but was running with it. The witness stated that he has seen a wolf in that area of the woods on more than one occasion and that the one behind the creature looked very much the same as the previous one which had left a paw print around five and a half inches. The witness estimated that if the creature stood up it would be around nine feet tall. He also noted that the hair on the back and body appeared longer than the hair on its head and arms. My initial contact with the witness was at his residence. He invited us in and we began discussing the area. His experience and approximately where it was located. He and one of his daughters hopped in his truck and we followed him to the area of the first experience. It took some time to get there. The two tracks are not easily traversed by mere cars. Four-wheel drive was required that day. <clears throat> Along the way we took numerous photos of, of interesting tree structures. The first spot he took us to was a location that he and the family routinely camp at, a 20 feet by 40 feet indent into the brush off one of the two tracks. He showed us a fairly large stick structure nearby which appeared to be at least 15 feet tall. There is also a smaller mini-me version right next to it and we also noticed that there are a lot of arches in the surrounding woods. Now, they could be from snow load or not. I am just noting that there are dozens and dozens of them around in the woods. We also found a ORV trail that had branches, limbs and a tree leaning over it blocking access down it, not saying it's anything but interesting. We also encountered something that the witness drove past but I found very interesting so I stopped to look at it and take some pictures. What I found was part of a tree suspended horizontal up a ways in a tree held by these branches. Now I know what some may say, okay so what, but if you notice the tree is bigger than the branches holding it, so if it fell the weight and size should have broken those limbs. Also if you look at the last picture you see that it was cut by a chainsaw. Now my question is simple, what type of individual would cut a tree down only to hoist it back up into the air, setting it on a few tree limbs? Second encounter. The second area is on the western side of Dead Stream Swamp, which was designated as a National Natural Landmark in 1976 and is part of the O. Sable State Forest. The 11,680-acre parcel, according to Michigan DNR, is an exceptionally large example, one of the largest in the United States, of a northern white cedar swamp. Considered to be the climax in bog forest development, large white cedar swamps are disappearing partially due to the demand for this timber product. Besides swamp forest, the landmark contains approximately 800 acres of deciduous upland forest. Shrubs and sedges bordering the lower reaches of Dead Stream and the 60-acre Bear Lake. A bog pond bordered by an expansive sphagnum heath mat. 
there are a varied assortment of wildlife, example geese, ducks, deer, squirrels, raccoons, etc., along with farm crops, examples soybean, corn, fruit, etc. The other encounter occurred on the border of a swamp, with trees to the north and west, and bushes lining the two-track that lead to the clearing. There are several trails to the north and northeast of the clearing that go off into the woods or into the swamp. The witness's second encounter occurred south of Higgins Lake, near an area that is called Dead Stream Swamp. There was a two-track that went from the main road back towards and skirting the western edge of the swamp, ending at a clearing that opened up to around a 150 feet in diameter. The witness stated that it was him, family, and friends that were gathering for a party. There was a fire going, and everyone was laughing, sitting around in chairs or at the picnic table that the witness brought. As the evening progressed, they started noticing sounds coming from the woods surrounding the clearing breaking branches, vocalizations, and what sounded like a tree crashing to the ground. They eventually saw a silhouette moving in the woods, west of the clearing, and that prompted everyone to decide to leave. The witness, friends, and family proceeded down the two-track towards the main road and came across a tree laying across their path. Several, several of the partygoers grabbed chainsaws, cut the tree up to move it, allowing everyone to eventually leave. The picnic table is still in the clearing. The witness currently has no intentions on retrieving it. The second experience was brought up by the witness at the t tail end of the discussion we were having about his first encounter. Afterwards, he offered to take us to the spot, but wanted us to understand that when it gets starts getting dark he wanted out of that area. Upon arrival I noticed that the turnoff he took was an easy one to miss if you're driving down the road and were not familiar with the area. But once on the two track after about 10 to 20 feet you lose sight of the main road. The dirt path wound back and forth for several hundred yards before coming out into the clearing with the swamp to the right, woods to the front and left. Upon exiting the vehicles, we walked around the clearing as the witness proceeded to explain the circumstances of the night. He pointed the directions out of the vocalizations. He showed us where they saw the silhouette of the creature walking in the woods. It was late day, and with the sun behind the trees, everything looked like a silhouette in that direction. We walked into the woods on the north side of the clearing and found numerous trails leading northwards, to the east and also to the west. After searching the area, we, the witness and I, decided to follow one of the trails to the east where we encountered the swamp, with trail continuing into it. The stick structure is compelling along with its mini me version. The many, many arches that can be seen throughout the woods makes you stop and wonder whether that many can be attributed to natural causes and then finding a tree cut near its base and suspended some 15 feet above ground by limbs that are smaller in diameter than the tree itself. As for the witness and his daughter, I found them to be credible in their statements. I do believe that they had an encounter with something that they believe was a Sasquatch being followed by a wolf. There are 14 reports within a 30 mile radius of this report. This witness recently shared his encounters in person at the August 2018 UPBSRO Town Hall meeting. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe below so we can expand our Squatch search with your help. Report number 61157 Class Bravo. Year 2018. 
Location details just off Dole Valley Road, a bit east of Coldwater Creek Campground. Observed, my wife and I were driving late in the night trying to reach the Coldwater Creek Campground near Yakult. By the time we got there, the campground was full. We kept driving and stopped at the first logging road that had a suitably flat spot for camping. We sleep in the back of our SUV. It was a short, dead-end logging road in a recovering clear cut. We set up camp and went to sleep. Around 2.30 a.m., my wife awoke to our pet rabbit scrambling around in the driver's footwell. The rabbit had gotten down there and couldn't get back up. As my wife reached up there to rescue the bunny, she felt something firmly touch her leg. She described it as a firm press and then deliberate downward motion. At first, she was confused because we were inside the car, but then she remembered that we kept the sliding rear windows open slightly for ventilation. The spot where she was touched was pressed against that opening. We built a sleeping platform in our car that puts us near the level of the windows. She heard nothing super obvious, but immediately afterwards she thinks she heard a couple of extremely light footfalls. We stayed mostly silent for about an hour, just listening for anything, but heard nothing else. I finally mustered the courage to peek out a window, but couldn't see anything. The next morning, we found very large, muddy fingerprints on our car near where my wife was touched. We have pictures of these prints, which we would be glad to submit. In the photos, you can see where I tried to recreate the prints with my own fingers. I have medium-sized hands and the prints are much larger. We looked around a bit, taking note of things. On my wife's side of the car was only a fairly narrow strip of road and after that was dry, crunchy grass and brush. Whatever touched her had to be able to walk along the narrow strip, otherwise we would have heard it in the dry brush. It also had to be tall enough to reach the window. We feel these factors probably rule out four-legged animals. We considered the idea that a person could have been messing with us, but there are some issues with that which makes us skeptical. First, we feel a person wouldn't have been so quiet. Second, we find that it's hard to believe someone trying to scare us would have simply touched her leg, left prints, and called it good. More than likely, a person would have taken things farther than that. That would really be showing a lot of restraint for a prankster. Last, the prince would have been a very large person, one who also thought to get their hands muddy beforehand. Also notice just the fingerprints. Other witnesses, my wife was the only one who experienced the touch, but we both saw the fingerprints. Other stories, I only know of the other reports in the area from your site. Time and conditions, about 2.30 a.m., clear but dark outside. I believe the moon was visible, but I can't remember how much. Environment, clear cut, bordered by evergreen forest, logging land. Somewhere nearby was moving water, but we couldn't see it. Follow-up investigation report by BFRO investigator Charles Lamica. I interviewed the witness telephonically on 18 November 2018. I mostly spoke with C, the wife of the gentleman who filed the report. One note of correction, this event took place near Cold Creek Campground, not Coldwater Creek Campground. I've synopsized C's statements below. We own a 1995 Mitsubishi Montero SUV. We modified the back end of it by adding a sleeping platform where we sleep when we are camping. We have a pet rabbit that travels with us. When we got to Cold Creek Campground and found it was full, we drove further up the road and pulled off into an old clear cut to spend the night. It was about 11 p.m. when we got there. Because the air temperature was mild, we left the side windows open when we went to bed. 
The night was dark with not much of a moon. Late in the night, I was awakened by the sound of our rabbit scrambling around. It was up in the front seat area of the car. I had been sleeping on the platform in the back on the driver's side of the vehicle. I was on my side with my body facing towards the outside of the car. As I was reaching forward to check on the rabbit, I suddenly felt something grab my leg near the knee. It felt like a hand. It pushed down firmly on my leg, then slid down my leg about an inch. I instinctively pulled away from the touch and completely froze. I was too scared to look out the window. I heard two soft footfalls on the driver's side of the car, the side I was on. They sounded to be moving away from me. I never went back to sleep. About 5.30 a.m. I finally had to get out of the car because I needed to go to the bathroom. That's when we found the palm print and fingerprints on the window of the car. My husband photographed them with his cell phone. The prints are much larger than a normal human's prints. This is the second time we've had a nighttime visitor while camping. The first time we were camping in the Mount Baker area. It was earlier in the summer. At that time we heard some really deep hooting sounds, almost like an owl but so deep and resonant that we could feel the sounds in our chest. The sounds were close and made us so nervous that we decided to leave. We packed up and went home because of it. An interesting note is that both times we've had possible Bigfoot activity, we had our rabbit in the car with us. I found C's story to be compelling and it was obvious that recalling the incident was an emotional situation for her. I could hear the fear in her voice while she was describing the event to me. I explained to C that Sasquatches seem to have an overpowering curiosity about humans, which causes some Sasquatches to approach under the cover of darkness to further investigate intruders. I don't know if the presence of the pet rabbit enhanced the curiosity of a Sasquatch, but it's an interesting thought that perhaps the rabbit was scrambling about because a giant ape was peering at it through the window. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe below so we can expand our Squatch search with your help. Check out our new I Believe coffee mugs in description below. They are an excellent way to start your day.